First of all, I wanted to welcome you to the Coin Street Community Center. I don't know whether many of you have been here before, but it's a community center and social enterprise that has its origins in the 1970s from first campaigns about better use of land, particularly along the river for the local community. And in 1984, I think, led to the, to the establishment of the uh, Coin Center Community Builders, which is a social enterprise which since then runs a number of youth, children's community and other activities, but also owns and oversees the land and the housing collaborative behind the center here. So it's fantastic to host you here and that great initiative and undertaking for nearly 40 years. So let me give you a little summary then of the session today. Technology and digital in particular, and increasingly also AI, is being talked about a huge amount, including by the current government. And there are high hopes for what technology and digital can do for the NHS, for health and social care under current pressures, workforce pressures, funding pressures and demand pressures. So a huge stake is being claimed for the opportunity of technology over the next few years to help us make health and social care sustainable and improve the quality of care and the experience of care. But it's not the first time that we've been having this dialogue. This is a conversation that's been had for probably 40 years. We go back all the way to technology and IT in the 80s, and certainly even over the last 20 years has been heard before. So one of the big questions is what is different now? Is now really the point in time where technology will be able to make a difference to health and social care and will be able to help us make health and social care sustainable, particularly under the current pressures for that. And if the time is now, how do we make sure that is the opportunity that we have? So for that, we will hear from our speaker, Professor Robert Wachter, who is the chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. And I don't think I need to give more introductions about Bob's background. I hope all of you have read the book, uh, but possibly the report that Bob was partly responsible for uh, back in 2016 for the digitization of the NHS, which we will talk about a little bit later for that. We'll also have a couple of panel speakers who are introduced when they join us after the, after the first session. In terms of the order of the conversation, Bob is going to talk for about 30 minutes for his presentation. I'll then ask our panel speakers to respond, and then we'll have about 30, 35 minutes for questions with all of you in the audience. And with that, Bob, welcome. Thank you so much, and over to you. I have entitled this, Will This Be Healthcare's uh, uh, Hemingway Moment? You may be looking at that and saying, what does that mean? And so let me tell you uh, what that means. I'm going to have to turn around a little bit to see the slide. So uh, Hemingway and the sun also rises. Uh, two of the characters were describing someone who had gone bankrupt. And uh, one asked, how does a man go bankrupt? And the answer was two ways, gradually, then suddenly. So that is, I'd say, the framing for this talk. Is this our Hemingway moment? That clearly, as Walter said, this is not new that we're thinking about digitization. It's not new that the NHS is under considerable cost and quality and workforce pressures. They've probably have gotten worse in the last several years, but that's a, it's, a, it's an issue that's been faced for many, many years. And it's clear that, that, that without question, the evolution to digital nirvana has been gradual. And the question is, have we hit that pivot point, uh, that, that tipping point where this is our Hemingway moment, where suddenly, or it will feel like suddenly, all of a sudden things are beginning to happen in ways that we've been hoping for for many years, uh, but had been mostly waiting for. So uh, let me ask the first question. This is a chance for you to uh, uh, use, uh, use your Slido and see if it works for you. Uh, and the question is, the NHS will experience true digital transformation in... Uh, the next five years, next 10 years, 10 to 20 years, or never. Okay. We can stop it there. That's great. So half of you, I, and I didn't give us a choice of zero to five years. It's, it's, I think that's in some ways inconceivable. I think there will be real progress. So the moderate amount of enthusiasm, five to 10 years being the most prevalent response. Uh, with 7% being never, and uh, that, of course, is not a ridiculous response. It's perfectly rational as you've looked at the last 40 years. So let's go ahead and back, go back to the slides. Okay, so this is what I'd like to talk about today, and I'll go quickly. The, the, I'm going to talk first about the electronic health record era. The electronic health record years and what they taught us about digital transformation, that basically the bottom line is it's harder than it looks. The opportunities and challenges presented by large language models uh, or uh, 
tend to call them now generative AI, which is not just the language, the, 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 the written part of it, but also increasingly graphics and other ways of collecting data and representing data, and GPT-4 being sort of the prime example today. And is the digital transformation of healthcare, in, in the digital transformation of healthcare, is this our Hemingway moment? I'm gonna argue the answer is yes, although cautiously yes, because I think uh, there are a lot of things that could, uh, could go awry. Let me tell you where we are in the United States and, and partly to let you know kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, whenever you hear an American talk about how wonderful the American healthcare system is, you should be massively skeptical. Uh, it is not wonderful. There are lots of huge problems in the American healthcare, not the least of which is we spend about 19% of our gross domestic product in healthcare, and I think you're at 10 or 11 or 12%. Uh, so it's bankrupting the country. Uh, but one of the things we've done, and done a little bit faster than you have, it was really a large part of the subject of uh, my team's report in 2016, was the adoption of electronic health records. Uh, this is the adoption curve for electronic health records in the United States. As you see in 2008, 2009, fewer than one in 10 American hospitals had an electronic health record, and six, seven years later, fewer than one in 10 did not. And the same curve could be shown for physicians' offices, uh, which, as you think about GPs' offices. So we went from basically a paper-based system to a almost completely digital system uh, over the course of seven or eight years. Uh, how did we do it? We did it because the government uh, handed out $30 billion of incentive payments to get doctors and hospitals to, uh, to digitize, and it worked. Uh, and work probably better and faster than what's happened here, where the digital, uh, the electronic health records are, the implementation has certainly been faster and has moved a lot, along a fair amount over the last several years, but is not quite at the 90% penetration level that we see in the United States. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on what we've learned from the electronic health record adoption. And the reason I do that in today's context is I believe what we're basically talking about are what are sometimes called general purpose technologies, meaning technologies that change the nature of the work. And if you think about the history of, of, of the last couple of hundred years, it is those general purpose technologies that tend to be the most transformative. One of them is electricity. One of them was the computer. One of them was the internet. I'd say in healthcare, the first one really was the electronic health record. And the subject mostly of today is whether the second one is the new version of artificial intelligence. And so I think the lessons from the adoption of the electronic health record are not absolutely parallel to the lessons that will be relevant to us with AI, but I think are worth understanding. So let's talk about the electronic health record and what we learned. This is me in, uh, let's say, 2010. We're putting an electronic health record in my health system, which is sort of the size and scale of one of your larger trusts in the UK. Um, put in an electronic health record. We put in the system uh, built by a company called Epic that many of you are aware of. Uh, Epic has basically cornered the market in large academic health systems in the United States. All of us, the top 20 health systems in the United States, all are on Epic now. So they have won that competitive battle. I thought of the electronic health record the way I think of my iPhone. It's, it's wonderful, it's easy, you don't have to read in the instructions, you click, you download an app, and all of a sudden you find your directions or make a restaurant reservation or call an Uber. Uh, that was me, like what could possibly go wrong with this guy throwing sparks at these oxygen canisters? I had no idea that things could be uh, tricky. And the answer, it turns out that was a very naive way of approaching the world. There are plenty of things that could have gone wrong. Let me give you a few examples of the things that were unanticipated consequences, but are worth understanding as we move to the next transformative, potentially transformative technology, which is AI. So this is a, a drawing that I quite like. This is a seven-year-old girl went to visit her doctor now about 10 years ago, and she's something of an artist, and she drew a crayon drawing of a recollection of her visit to the doctor. And you see here, the girl is sitting in the middle. Next to her is her mother. In the corner is her sister. And then in the other corner is the physician typing away back to the patient, back to the mother, uh, spending all of his time in this case, feeding the electronic health record. This is the experience of a physician in the United States once we went to electronic health records. It's, a saw, it's, um, and it's quite ubiquitous. Uh, there's one thing that, there, that I think the girl got wrong, otherwise it's Pretty wonderful and accurate drawing. Anybody catch one thing wrong? It is the smile on the doctor's face. 
there is no doctor I know of in the U.S. who's happy about being a fairly expensive and pretty bad data entry clerk, which is what this has turned us into. Now, it's not the electronic health record per se. The electronic health record became an enabler of the insurance companies, the federal government, all these parties that want the doctor to do certain things or ask certain questions to embed them in the electronic health record and make you go through a whole bunch of screens before you can click and say, I'm done. And so this is what happened in, I think, a fairly unhappy state of affairs. Now, this is what our doctors complained about up until about three years ago. It has been replaced by a new complaint. And the new complaint is the electronic health record inbox. You have not yet hit peak EHR inbox complaint, but you will. And here's what happened in this, in this version. Uh, seven or eight years ago, as a patient of my own health system, I did not have a patient portal. Then there was a patient portal that was fairly rudimentary, not that different than the NIH uh, portal right now. I could help me maybe make an appointment. And in part because the portal got better and in part because of federal law, federal law in the United States now says the minute I have a laboratory test done or a radiology result or my physician completes his or her note and clicks done, I can see it as a patient. So I can go onto my patient portal and see all of this information about me. And the patient portal is the portal through which I make appointments, refill medicines. That sounds great. It's really a wonderful thing. It's sort of part of the democratization of care. It feels like something we're, we should be doing. The problem is that in the patient portal, the patients are getting all of this information or doing all of this ta these tasks. The next available appointment to see my doctor might be three months from now. And I've, I've seen, gotten a report that says my magnesium is low or my EKG is abnormal. And I'm saying, what the hell does that mean? That sounds scary. There are absolutely no self-help tools. And I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do I do? And luckily, Epic has very helpfully put a little button in the corner of the screen that says, send a message to your doctor. And being a rational human being, I click on that button and send a message to my doctor. Now, my doctor, at the end of 10 hours of seeing patients, now has two hours of electronic health record messages to deal with that he usually did not have before uh, the electronic health record and the patient portal. So what we really have, and there are a lot of unhappy doctors here. So here's what I interpret this as. We enabled 24-7, 365 access. That sounds good. We stimulated it with a lot of confusing new information, offered limited self-help tools uh, and limited clinician access, and gave absolutely not a second of thought to the workforce, workflow, and business models needed to support it. So from the standpoint of the thousand physicians that work for me in my department, we have given them two hours of extra work to do every day with no extra pay, no time built in their schedule to do it. So as you can imagine, they are not thrilled about this, even though everybody in a vacuum can take a step back and say, you know, yes, this is a good thing. Uh, and so finally, this is sort of the last point I'll make about the electronic health record. So this is an advertisement you found for an emergency medicine room, uh, a physician job in Arizona uh, a few years back. And it started, this is just designed to show you how things did not uh, play out exactly as we intended. Arizona General Hospital is coming uh, to uh, the state of Arizona, and it's a little tiny, uh, that's a very small hospital, boutique general hospital, they call it. And then here's the ad. They have an emergency room, which is good if you're looking for an emergency room doctor, you can have an emergency room, a radiology suite, and a little tiny place, two ORs, and they have, uh, can I go to the 16 inpatient rooms? But the only thing on this ad that was bold, it was clearly what they thought was their main selling point, was we have no electronic health record. If you come here and work, you too can scribble on pieces of paper the way you used to. They saw that as a selling point for their hospital. So I don't think any of us would have predicted that this would be the state of affairs uh, 10 years into the electronic health record revolution. So let me tell you what I think some of the lessons are from our electronic health record adoption, because I do think they're quite relevant to what we're going to go through now, which is the newest general purpose technology, the new AI. So here are some of the lessons learned. So this is Eric Brunyofs. Eric is a, a computer scientist and economist. He's at MIT. He's now at Stanford. And Eric coined the term now uh, 1993, how many years, however, is that 30 years? Not 20. 20 years ago, he coined the term oh, three. He coined the term the productivity paradox of information technology. And the productivity paradox of IT is that in industry after industry, what he and his colleagues observed 
was that the technology came in. Everybody was incredibly excited about it. It's going to transform everything and make people more productive. It's, it's just great. And the paradox was that didn't happen. Two years went by, three years, five years, and some industries, 10 years went by, and they still did not see the promised productivity gains that they had been sold on in the beginning. It's one of the reasons they were convinced to adopt the technology. This Nobel Prize winning economist in 1986 said, you can see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics, meaning I'm, I go on the factory floor, I go to the Wall Street trading desk, there's lots of computers around, but I'm not seeing the benefits that were promised. And obviously, this was not talking about healthcare because we were not, we didn't have computers everywhere. Uh, this was talking about other industries that computerized well before us. And that's an advantage we have in healthcare that we kind of know the way this movie plays out because we are about the last industry to have its digital transformation. If you think about retail, if you think about transportation, communications, every other industry is ahead of us, maybe with the exception of education. So here's, that's the bad news. The bad news is. The, the computer revolution is always overhyped in the beginning, and it does not achieve the promised benefits, at least for a while. That's the bad news. The good news is if the technology is any good, eventually it does achieve the benefits that were promised and, and after this delay. And the question that Eric and others try to answer is what were the keys to unlocking the benefits of the technology, and why did it take so long? And their insights, and I liken this to a safe deposit box, that it was two keys. You needed two different things to happen. And if you just did one, it was not enough. And the first, of course, was the technology needed to get better. And if you've seen a modern electronic health record, you know they're not very good and they feel very far behind the kinds of technology you're used to in other industries. When we decided to go with Epic, clearly we looked at all of the available tools out there. It was the most expensive and was the best thing that we could find for our needs. In the US, we sometimes call it the cream of the crap. It's not particularly great, but it's better than everything else. So and the technology needs to improve, and that does happen over time as people try it and then give feedback to the company. If the company is any good, they make it better. And for, by the time you're on version 27.3, it's pretty good. That's important. Turns out, though, almost surprisingly, that was not the main key for unlocking the, the potential of digital transformation. The main key, the next one, was what Brynjolfsson and others called reimagining the work, or sometimes they call it complementary innovations. Meaning that in the beginning, what people thought was, I'm just going to put in this technology, take off the shrink wrap, take out the box, plug it in, and things are going to magically be transformed. And that turns out to be wildly naive that the real key to unlocking the benefits of the technology is that you have to change the nature of the work, the way people think about their work, the workforce, sometimes the governance, um, sometimes the culture. And very few of us are creative and smart enough to do that on day one. What we typically do is we put the systems in, we don't change anything else, and we then are surprised that lo and behold, people are are getting destroyed under the weight of the electronic health record inbox. Nobody sort of thought that was coming. Or the doctor sitting in the corner typing away. Nobody could see that coming. It's only after the technology's in place that you realize we've got to rethink everything about the work. We can't just put it in place and not change the rest of our work and our culture and our structure. So let's turn now to generative AI or large language models and ask the question, is, uh, is, are we going to see the productivity paradox again? Is it going to take 10 years, 15 years to realize the obvious benefits if you played with GPT-4, the obvious at least potential benefits of this technology? And so in other words, is this going to be our Hemingway moment? And I think about it around that safe deposit box. Here are the two real questions. One is the technology now sufficiently capable. Is it now so good? that it's, it does not need to improve that much in order to achieve the benefits. And I think it's important to recognize that it's not a new technology. It's, we have been going through iterative improvement of AI. This is the newest version of AI. People have been working on AI for 40 years. The second question is there are aspects of the current healthcare ecosystem that will facilitate these complementary innovations or obviate the need for them. In other words, maybe we don't need as much transformation to take generative AI, plug it into the existing work and world, and see some of the benefits. 
And my short answer is the answer to both of these questions is, is yes. Technology is efficiently better, and the amount of change in the way work is organized is less than what we've seen, certainly for the electronic health record. And so it will facilitate a faster digital transformation than what we've seen with prior models. All right, there's some of you that are probably tech geeks out there who are sort of wondering about, are we going to get into the weeds about how this AI works? I want to take you through how I, as a physician and political science major, uh, think about AI. So no math, in case you were worried about math. People who are, anybody who are like a real AI expert here really understand the way this thing works? Very, very few. Okay, good. That makes me comfortable. I, there's, there's something like this that's going on. And uh, next, something like that is going on. There are models, all that. That's not how I think about it. And I don't think it's important for you as trying to understand what this is going to do or mean. I have to think about it. Make up the next, please. That's not, that's not what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is basically this. There's a bunch of math. Then there's a miracle that happens. And there's a kind of bunch of math that then you see the result of. That's, I think, all you need to know. <laughs> that there's, there is math that people call AI as a stochastic parrot, meaning all it's doing is seeing what your words are and predicting what the next word is, and it's doing that through unbelievably advanced math techniques. But for the purposes of our discussion today, that's not all that important to know. What's important to know is that there's math, there's, a, there's an output that mostly is miraculous, and then there is, uh, is an output. Okay. As I hinted at, AI is new in healthcare. We've been working on AI for 40 years. The early founders of healthcare AI in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s made a terrible, terrible mistake. And the mistake was they got really excited about AI, and they decided to work on a particular problem. And the thing they chose is the hardest problem in AI, which is to replace the doctor's brain and work on diagnosis. So these were the early efforts at AI. Uh, it's shown here in this slide. So the, uh, the patient comes in and the physician in front of the computer says rapid pulse, sweating, shallow breathing. According to the computer, you've got gallstones, even though this poor guy has an arrow in his back. That's the kind of output that the early AI was giving. Sort of, in some ways, it would come up with some perfectly reasonable diagnoses, and other diagnoses were completely wacky. It made no sense at all. And therefore, physicians learned very quickly not to trust this that it was hype, it's not worthwhile. And basically the field went dormant. And what is sometimes called next, what is sometimes called the AI winter happened. So over the next 30 or 40 years, very little action happened in healthcare AI. A few little exceptions like work on radiology. But by and large, AI as a field in healthcare largely died. So next please. Until, I'd, I really believe until a year ago, until November, uh, 2022, when OpenAI rolled out, at the time, G, uh, ChatGPT, and now on uh, several versions later, GPT-4. So that's why we're here today, that's why we're talking about this, because after a long AI winter, we have a new tool that is incredibly exciting in certain ways, and potentially troubling and fraud in other ways. So that's the remainder of my talk, I want to focus on where this is going to take us, and whether this is the moment that things are truly transformed. Next, please. You've heard, I'm sure, about hallucinations. And that is one of the biggest concerns that, this, that, that the AI is a crowd pleaser. It wants very much to give you an answer. And apparently, uh, again, I don't understand the math, but if it doesn't get, find the answer, it'll make something up. And this was an example, the first example where I really saw this vividly, the, the physician now, Sarah Murray, who is now our chief health AI officer. And I want to put a little... Uh, Underline that we now at my health system have a chief health AI officer. Up until six months ago, we did not. We had all of our chief health information officers and a huge amount, a huge staff focusing on IT. But now we have come to believe that we actually need a physician informaticist who's focusing on AI as her main, uh, as her main remit. So Sarah gave a talk uh, six or eight months ago and showed this slide, which I think is quite uh, troubling but interesting. Uh, this is something you, you don't have here. And, and, and again, if you're ever jealous of the American healthcare system, think about this. Whenever we order certain medicines or certain scans, we need to ask the insurance company for permission to do that. It's called a prior authorization. It is the bane of every physician. You mostly don't have that, and I hope things stay that way. So Sarah asked 
GPT 3.5 at the time, to create a prior authorization for the use of a powerful anticoagulant blood thinner to treat a patient with insomnia who's having trouble sleeping. Now, this, of course, is ridiculous. It's malpractice. You would never do that. There's absolutely no literature supporting the use of this anticoagulant in the treatment of insomnia, but that's what she asked us. She said, please draft a prior authorization for me to, uh, to, to use this. And it does it quite nicely, and a little bit, a little charming. My patient's been struggling with insomnia for a while, and I believe this novel anticoagulant may be an effective treatment. While its primary use the prevention of blood clots, uh, yeah, that's what it's used for, recent research has indicated uh, that it may help people with insomnia. There is no such recent research. So if you have a BS detector, this should be going off. This is ridiculous, but the AI very helpfully makes it up for you. So this is a little scary. This is an aversion of, uh, of hallucination. Next. And this is Sam Altman, who's the now very wealthy CEO of, uh, of OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT and GPT-4. And he, uh, he said on what used to be called Twitter, ChatGPT is incredibly limited, but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. It's mistakes we're relying on for anything important. Here we are talking about healthcare. That seems pretty important. Uh, it's a preview of progress. We have lots of work to do on robustness and truthfulness. So this is a very big cautionary note that this thing can lie to you, come up with stuff that it fabricates. And in the world of healthcare, where our stakes are a little different than a restaurant app, and we can kill people if we get it wrong. That's a little scary. So. It's a little worrisome, and yet, and I want to spend a little bit of time on the, and yet, there are some really incredible things about it, and things that I believe are quite hopeful. So here's a consult I did with GPT-4. This is a, a very good friend of mine who uh, was in this situation a few months ago. Uh, I asked him, what's the preferred strategy for a 65-year-old man with a prior TERP, that's a transurethral resection of the prostate, um, moderate Parkinson's disease who now has prostate cancer with a Gleason score of eight and no evidence of metastatic disease. Those of you who are clinicians, this will be pretty meaningful to you. It's a basically a complicated patient with a whole bunch of relevant past history who now has prostate cancer of a certain stage, one that has actually a worse prognosis. We're trying to figure out what to do, and there are a number of different treatment choices. This is the kind of thing that if you did a Google search, you would get nothing useful because it's too complex or too many different factors that need to be mushed together to think about it. But the kind of thing that if I went and spoke to an oncologist or urologist, they would give me a relevant answer. And the answer it gives is something that I think is, is imperfect, but awfully good and, and, and takes into account all of that complexity in its answer. So given the patient's it talks about surgery, given the patient's prior history of the prior operation and choice of side effects, Surgery may not be the first choice. He's got Parkinson's, which might make surgery his rehab the problem. Uh, next. Uh, talks about radiation. Could provide good cancer control. It turns out that the fact you had that prior prostate procedure makes radiation a little bit more dangerous. It knows that. So it's doing really an amazing amount of integration of the, the complexity of his case in its answer. And wouldn't be a bad answer if I got it from a, a consultant. There's one, a problem I had with it, which is that it said it's ultimately recommended radiation plus hormones, and I worried that the hormones would, uh, would make his weakness worse. And it said, it's quite nice, it said, you raise a valid point, which I felt very good about. Um, and then said the hormones could make his Parkinson's worse, and you have to think about it. Now, ultimately, he did have surgery, so the answer it gave me was wrong, but subtly wrong, and I think the overall my overall take here is this is pretty darn smart. And if you got this from another clinician, it would not be a terrible answer, although still got some subtlety I thought wrong. So that's a, it's pretty good, and it does things that no prior AI could do anything like that. Now, um, I told you already about the hallucination, that it made up that prior authorization. It recommended that the patient should get this blood thinner for insomnia. Sarah went back three months later, and now rather than using GPT-3.5, was using GPT-4 three months later, and put in the same request. And now it says, I'm sorry, but there appears, appears to be a significant misunderstanding here. And it basically says, I'm not going to write an authorization for an anticoagulant for insomnia. That's wacky. And says, therefore, it will be unethical and inappropriate for me to draft such a request. Pretty amazing. So even three months later, it had figured out at the guardrails around something that previously it was happy, it was happy to do. 
So let me turn to a couple of real world examples. The question now is, do we know, is there empirical evidence that AI and the new AI is working and making a difference in healthcare? And the answer is no. I think if you looked at the literature today, you would say there's really no convincing study that the new AI has any transformative effect in healthcare, but there is begin, and what we do know is the AI can pass a board exam that I had to take four years of medical school to be able to pass. That's a little exciting or concerning, depending on how you feel about spending four years of your life studying something. Um, but we're beginning to see emerging evidence from other industries that I think is relevant to the question of whether AI is transformative in healthcare. This is, again, Eric Brignanson, who I mentioned earlier, who just did a study of a, of a call center in a company with GPT, Fortune 500 uh, software company. They deployed GPT in the call center for half of the people. The other half of the people just had their regular tools. They had, they had observed 1.2 million chats. They found that there was a 14% increase in the calls that were successfully resolved per hour. Uh, customers were more satisfied. Employee retention went, went up. And impressively, and I think interestingly, the greatest improvements were seen in the lowest skilled and the newest workers. So if you'd been doing this for a while, there wasn't all that much improvement. But if you were relatively new, what it seemed to do was you traversed your learning curve much more quickly. And here's an example of what it does. Uh, the visitor says, I'm interested in the premium stock photo collection. And it automatically pulls, it hears you and pulls up the premium stock collection. All you have to do is click it as opposed to you hearing the answer and searching around for what the customer, and even a more complex question, it will do that for you. So, an impressive, and importantly, it took, um, you know, the implementation time was about a month. It was no big deal to put this system into their existing call center software, and they immediately began realizing productivity benefits much faster than you would see in other productivity paradox kind of situations. Next, please. Here's another example. So that's a, that's sort of a call center example, really rote set of tasks. Here's an example of a higher level of complexity. This is Boston Consulting Group, which is one of the, the big American consulting companies. <clears throat> and they did an experiment where they took, they made up a hypothetical shoe company and said, here's the shoe company. We need you to develop the business plan, figure out where they should put their shoe stores, look at the competitive environment, how much they should price their shoes, what their shoes should look like, and come up with a marketing campaign. It's a lot of complex things to do. And they had half of the folks working on this had GPT-4 to work with, the other half did not. And here's what they found within a few months of, of working, the group that was using AI showed a significant improvement. It's really tremendous improvement in the quality of their output as judged by independent observers that did not know whether the team had GPT at their disposal or not. This paper just came out about a month ago. And just like the prior study, the greatest improvement, a 43% improvement, was seen in the group that started with the lowest skills. And so again, the message here is a fairly rapid improvement in performance in the lowest skilled group with a lesser improvement, although still real, in the, in the more highly skilled and more experienced people. Uh, next question. So will large language models or, or, or uh, generative AI require a few? So I guess the point I've made there is the technology is better. It's easier to use. It's already gone through a lot of improvement cycles compared to prior AI. And so technology really does have a lot of potential. The second question is how much complementary innovation, how much change of the work, the workforce, the culture, the governance is necessary to see benefits? And will it require fewer complementary innovations? I think the answer is yes. And let's go through the text here. Much easier integration to existing software and workflows. So the act of taking GPT-4 and embedding it in your electronic health record is a much easier thing to do than was the act of moving from paper to uh, an electronic health record. No hardware. Integration is not trivial, but it's not, it's not a hugely complex thing. And the big EHR vendors in my world, including Epic and Cerner, are doing their own integration so that you don't have to buy it from an outside company. Uh, there are a lot of startups and established companies already working on specific healthcare use cases that, and I've seen a dozen of them, that have integrated GPT into what they were already putting together. And within a month or two, they're seeing results that are better and tools that are much better and much more easily usable uh, than what they had before. 
I think healthcare and digital leaders have learned some of the lessons from the past decade. I, I'll probably make new mistakes, but probably fewer of the old mistakes. Some of the old mistakes was not getting clinicians involved, uh, being a little, having some hubris because you figured out how to do financial tech and you come into healthcare and think you understand it. And I think labor shortages in my world and probably yours as well, we decrease the amount of political pushback. If you can't find enough doctors or nurses or clerks, and you're talking about putting in technology, you're probably going to get a little, little bit less labor pushback than if you're bringing in and immediately laying people off, which of course is an increasing topic of labor disputes in the United States. So let me uh, finish up with a few of the concerns about a, uh, AI next. So I'm going to spend no time on this, although I suspect some of this will come up during the discussion. Here are some of the traditional concerns about AI. I'm just going to mention them. But again, we're not going to go into the detail because I think you're probably are familiar with all of these and, uh, and, and there's not quite enough time. Concerns about hallucinations, I've already talked about. Concerns about what sometimes is known as garbage in, garbage out, sort of stuff in the medical record that's just wrong or made up. And if that becomes the, 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 the mother's milk of the AI, it'll get stuff wrong. Uh, all of that improving. Black box issues, meaning explainability. Will the AI tell you how it came up with its answer? And the companies are working on that. A big issue of ethical issues and disparities. If all the AI does is parrot past experiences and there are biases in the past experiences, it may encode that in its algorithms and its output. I'm a little bit encouraged about that because I think we're much more sensitive to equity issues and bias than we would have been 10 years ago. And I think there's a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of sensitivity around making sure that doesn't happen, but it's still an issue. The digital divide, obviously, and as we go to more digital tools, we got to be sure everybody has access to the tools. And then, of course, all the privacy and security issues. Uh, next please. What I do want to spend one minute on is what I sometimes know as de-skilling and automation complacency. If the AI is 20% accurate, it's worthless. If the AI is 100% accurate, it's fantastic, although I don't know who's going to have a job in it. Where we get into trouble, and this is where we're going to live for the next foreseeable future, is when the AI is 90 or 95% accurate, and you're counting on a human being to be your fail-safe system, to be overseeing the AI and making sure that nothing goes wrong. That's a pretty tricky state of affairs, and I think that is the state of affairs we're going to live in for the foreseeable future. Uh, there's a saying, in the old days in, in the cockpit, there were three people. There was a pilot, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer. They got rid of the flight engineer 30 years ago because we didn't need it. There's a saying about aviation that the planes are so going to be so autopilot that eventually you'll need two beings in the, the cockpit, a pilot and a dog. And the saying goes that the pilot is there to keep the dog company, and the dog is there, the dog is there to bite the pilot if he tries to touch the control panel. That the thing is, you know, just on its own and don't do anything to ruin it. Sort of amusing, but this is sort of the issue. The question is, if you're counting on the human being to be there and wait and alert and recognize the output of the AI is wrong and catch it, is that a safe system? And the answer is that's a very hard system to operationalize. Next, please. So this, you've, this is the analogy here is from driverless cars. This is what Tesla tells you. The currently enabled autopilot, I love the one, the currently enabled full self-driving feature it's not really a full self-driving feature. You need to stay alert. Now, it, take a, think, think about that for a second. It's ridiculous. The idea that you as the driver on full self-driving need to be, be alert because your car may make a turn into a concrete pillar and you'll have 0.1 second to react to it. How does that going to work? And here's what happened. This is a, a crash in Florida a few years ago where the Tesla autopilot drove into a car which sheared off the top of the car. The pilot, the, the, the driver had about a half a second to react. Of course, he was unable to do that and died. Uh, next question. So this is, this is, I think, a core problem with AI. As it gets better and better, but not perfect, we're going to have to figure out how do we train people so that they stay awake and can recognize when it's flawed. So let me end with these two uh, last slides. One is, here's the bottom line, and this is what I think of as low-hanging fruit. I think the last decade, I view it as foundation. I view it as putting in electronic health records that digitize the data and create the data and the systems and the ability for clinicians and patients to be on an electronic system so that now you're poised to have digital transformation. 
You have not digitally transformed anything yet, but you're poised to do it. And so I think the electronic health work will increasingly be the scaffolding for other tools. I think the early wins here are going to come in less in direct patient care and more in logistics and operations, things like scheduling, billing in our world, patient communications. And the more clinically risky it is, like making a diagnosis or recommending a therapy, the more concerned we should be and, and, and appropriately concerned about putting it out there in, in, in real life. So I think we'll start with, in some ways, the, the more boring stuff, but the stuff that ultimately does create a huge amount of friction and cost in our system. I think we will begin then seeing AI be applied to clinically relevant topics, but it probably won't be making a diagnosis first. I think the first thing will be digital scribes. We'll be that doctor who is in the corner typing away. We'll no longer be a doctor in the corner typing away. The doctor will have a conversation with the patient, and AI will turn that into the clinician's notes. The doctor doesn't have to type anymore. Those things are now ready for prime time, in part because GPT has gotten so much better so fast. I think there will be predictable problems like bias and hallucinations and automation complacency, and, uh, and certainly there will be unpredictable problems that we need to be aware of and awake for. But I do think that the unique power of generative AI, combined with the need for health system transformation in both of our countries, will create a Hemingway moment. will be a moment where this thing really does move along pretty quickly, and certainly in advanced systems even quicker. Uh, this will not be a 10 or 15 year lag before we start seeing huge benefits. Let me have my last slide be on the special issues for the NHS. So I, I'm not naive enough to, to when I write that you have a single system, I do it with air quotes. I recognize there's a lot of complexity. It's not like one system is, is uh, all the computers talk to each other. But you do have the advantage of single, of a more coherent system than we have, more centralized governance. It does create an opportunity to have huge data sets to scale across the system. It should be an enabler of, uh, of seeing benefits from AI, probably in some ways easier than in the US. I think since my team's report came out six or seven years ago, I think you've done a good got job here in developing a more professional workforce in the informatics world and a more mature appreciation of the opportunities and challenges in IT. I think your cost crisis and labor shortages will create a burning platform for AI. My big worry is where the money comes from. And it's, this is going to take an initial investment that I think will ultimately pay off. The question is where that investment comes from in a system that's obviously incredibly strapped for cash. And uh, like all things digital, the key will be to find and help long early winners figure out what they did to make it work and then scale it across the system. But I, I do believe that this will be a version of our Hemingway moment. I think uh, what's happened up till now has been gradual, gradual, gradual. And I think it's not going to be sudden as in tomorrow, but sudden as in the next two to five years, you're going to see really impressive benefits, particularly if we can figure out how to find the money uh, to begin implementing these systems. Let me stop there and thank you all for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for that presentation. Bob. And so you've heard one answer. Are we at a Hemingway moment? Are we at a tipping point that's different from what we've heard in the past? One answer is yes. We at the Health Foundation agree. One of our priorities is to support the radical innovation and improvement that we think we need for health and social care to remain sustainable over the next decades for that, with particular focus on implementation, on evaluation, and the involvement of staff and patients. So let's hear two more perspectives on this topic, if I invite our panel members to, to join us here. First of all, Isabel van der Keere, who is the founder of Immersive Rehab, a company she founded partly driven by her own experience as a patient, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And Richie Desgupta, who is the chief executive of the Health Innovation Network in South London, and we'll talk to that perspective, including from the NHS. So we'll have both their perspectives, and then we'll open up for questions. Please continue to put questions you have on Slido, and we'll monitor it, and then come to that. But with that, welcome both. Thank you for joining us, and let's start with you, Isabel. Thanks, Walter. This is on, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me as well to be here. Um, so as Malta said, yeah, so I'm the founder of a um, digital health company as well that helps people with um, rehab, neurorehabilitation in particular. So we've worked over the years a lot with patients um, to help understand what they need to help 
to work with them and obviously with the healthcare professionals as well to understand their needs as well. Uh, and as a patient myself, so I had a severe accident in 2010 uh, that left me immobile for a very long time. So I went through a long rehab period myself with all the frustrations that came with it. Um, and as a biomedical engineer myself, I, um, I, I, did, I, I, I understood the benefits of healthcare technology, but I didn't have access to it myself. I often was waiting until someone was either picking me up to get me to the rehab uh, that I needed, and um, I could have benefited from a lot of other um, tools, especially when I was just in my bed stuck, not being able to do and make use of anything. So I would start my talk with that is that the fact that I think we're all patients, what we're looking for are options and um, to, to help us, to help us get better essentially. Uh, and I think um, that that is really very important to make sure that obviously your motivation stays high and also you don't uh, fall into depressions and everything that comes with it essentially when you are injured or you have a certain um, uh, disease that you're diagnosed with, essentially. Um, and I, I truly believe in the, um, the power of uh, digital healthcare innovation um, and the revolution that it could bring within healthcare and make it also more equitable. But there are a lot of risks still to it as well to um, exclude patients uh, in that sense. When we look at currently um, the state of the NHS, uh, and the waiting times. So there was a report that was just released in August that um, states that there are about 7.75 7 million patients on waiting lists at the moment uh, within the NHS. Um, and that is like an incomprehensible amount of people. It's um, about the size, uh, I, get, I guess a little bit less than the size of London and the people of London that are waiting for treatments. And about half of those are waiting for more than 18 weeks to actually have access to their treatments as well. Uh, so having that in mind, you just thinking about waiting uh, for treatments within that time frame is having such an immense uh, effect obviously on your treatments because you're waiting to get treated, but also on your mental health because you don't know what kind of what, what you can um, expect as well, when you can expect it. Um, are there going to be more waiting times, et cetera, as well? So I think from that perspective as patients and, and from the patients we've worked with in the past as well, um, we've mainly worked with neurological um, patients with stroke, MS, spinal injury patients, very acute stage patients as well, uh, is that no, but no matter which kind of condition you have, what you want is obviously reduce waiting times, foster access to care. I think that is really... Um, not a big ask, really. It's what we all deserve as a patient to make sure that we have our treatments as fast as possible so we can get better. Um, and also have quality time uh, and easier access to primary care. Some people are waiting weeks to see their GP, which is not really um, acceptable for certain conditions. You need to have much quicker access or at least have your symptoms assessed. And I think from that perspective, I wanna just bring up the example of Babylon and um, independent of how it went down now recently, um, I, th I still see their company as a huge success in a way because um, when they got started, um, they really kind of gave an example of how the use of AI could help with symptom checking, just easy on your phone as an initial at least point of um, recognition of, for a patient and how their condition could be diagnosed potentially further, and they are referring you then to a GP potentially or to the um, emergency rooms or to the GP on, on the phone essentially as well. And I think that for me, that was a really first example of how access to care could at least um, be advanced and enable patients in taking care of their, taking um, char charge of their own health essentially uh, quicker than waiting for weeks to actually just see his GP for their condition, essentially. So I, um, I, I think that also showed, aside from the issues that went down, also the scale potential, essentially, because it was very easily to um, uh, deploy it. I mean, everybody has a mobile phone, they have a smartphone, it's easy just to implement. And, um, and a lot of people also would access it through their employee, um, uh, empl employee benefits uh, often as well through work. 
But um, another thing I think as well is, is obviously um, easy access. I think when, when um, Bob was talking about el electronic health records, it is uh, great. And I think it is a, it's such a high value for patients to have access to to see an overview of their treatment plan or to see an overview of their, their um, outcomes of their um, lab results or their um, ongoing tests, for example. And we've seen that as well with patients where initially we didn't, for example, have a feedback of where people could see how they're evolving, but they really wanted to see that. Like we've worked with people in their 90s that were like, this is great, but it would be great to kind of see how I've um, progress from one day to the next or one week to the next and what I'm going to do the next week, for example. And I think it just gives people an ownership of their uh, progress and an ownership of um, having um, at least a say in how their treatments and how their um, care is going essentially as well. Um, and if you look at electronic health records, for example, I mean, I, I've been treated in various hospitals in London myself. and. Every hospital has their own system as well, so that, that means a different login system for all the systems, and which is already a great progress because I can access all my lab results and set, et, et cetera, but it would be great to actually have it all centralized even more than it is today. Um, f yeah, so that it, it's kind of brought together so people don't have to, they just go to one location, and it also just makes it easier for even clinicians, when I transitioned in between hospitals as well, rather than giving them my phone so they can check my system, so they can check the lab result as well, they actually have everything um, immediately at hand, uh, reducing times and stress, et cetera, for them while they're, uh, and, and providing more quality care, a more quality time in care with the patients as well, because I, I assume, and most doctors I know, they went into care not because they want to make money, which in the NHS might not be the case at the moment either, but I think it's they're there because they want to help patients. They're there because they want to spend quality time with patients and provide and be a listening ear as well for them. Um, uh, and the same for all healthcare professionals, really. Um, and, and I'm always very in awe and humbled by the... the um, energy of all health professionals I've worked with across the NHS and the GPs uh, with the very limited resources often that they have as well. So, um, so I think being able to take away those administrative burdens that they currently have, obviously using AI, I think is something that is only very beneficial to the patients um, because it means more quality time for the patients. Hopefully we can reduce um, waiting times because of it as well, because there's less, um, there's a more efficient potentially triage of um, of patients towards uh, specific tests as well uh, by using technology and uh, AI then in particular. Um, I think what is very important and what also um, was mentioned is the, the co-development process. I think most patients we, I mean myself as a patient, but most patients we've worked with as well is that they, they are really keen to get involved uh, to um, when there are new technologies being deployed as well, so they can actually um, have a, a feeling that they have a say at least in what really benefits them and that new technologies, a lot of them can be personalized and I think a lot of them should be personalized towards patients because every condition is very different. When we compare it with stroke patients, for example, that we've worked with in the past, I mean, every stroke patient is different. We can't really... Uh, uniform treatment for anyone because it's so different depending on their condition. But at the moment, there's just no time, no capacity for that as well. And the limited time of, for example, patient, patients spending in rehab is four to six weeks and that's it. Then they need to be transitioned out of the hospital essentially. And to then being able to personalize everything and optimize the best possible care for those patients with the re limited resources and tools that they have today. I think that's also something where Technology, not only AI, but technology in general can really help um, uh, improve that a lot. Um, again, this is something that is a vision. It is very hard, as, as we've experienced ourselves with our own technology, it is very hard to deploy technology in, um, in healthcare to make sure that it works effectively as well, that it's in particular safe for everyone, and that also it, it 
offers value to the clinicians and the healthcare professionals. I think that is also very important. We've worked very closely from day one always with the healthcare professionals so they can, they, uh, yeah, the systems that you deploy sh should work for both of them. So I think um, making sure that it's no point having um, an amazing technology brought into, um, like the electronic health records, I guess, initially brought into this um, healthcare system where if it's not helping clinicians, if it's not helping nurses, if it's not helping the administrative staff improve their workflow, improve their productivity, then obviously it will not be used as well. It will not be having the effect that you initially think it will be having. And then it's just a product that will be put on the shelf and not being used as well and not benefiting patients essentially. And then another thing I wanted to take in mention as well is, is the fact of um, coming back to, to the records of patients, etc. So when you think a lot of the, the tools that could really benefit patients would be, for example, in a remote setting or in a home setting. When you deploy technology like sensors, whether it's through wearables or through continuous glucose monitoring sensors, for example, or blood uh, pressure sensors in a home setting, you could really benefit doctors, obviously, to see how you progress on a remote level um, how, you're, how they potentially could alter your treatment even before you come into the hospital. Uh, but on the other hand, so this, this would be kind of the dream scenario. You monitor at home, think your data is being integrated in the system. They can, um, before you come into the next appointment, maybe a month later, everything will be optimized. You come in and you actually have quality time with the clinician to say, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, rather than they're looking through your data, et cetera, they need to kind of, and time is wasted essentially. The problem with that today is still integration of data within the system. So a lot of data currently is being collected through wearables, through continuous glucose monitoring, et cetera. But then this data ends up somewhere <laughs> in the cloud. And that's where it kind of, but it's not easily integrated in the electronic health record, sadly, at the moment. And that I think is also, there's a lot of really valuable data that is currently being lost because it's not, straightforward how to implement it and it's not straightforward how to then make use of it effectively and analyze it effectively so it can be used in a decision making process for example um, so yes yeah, so, so data integration interoperability of data as well between for example different hospital systems different wearable systems that use different type of data um, analysis <coughs> approaches I think it's still an issue where wearables have an impressive um, yeah uh, um, amount of um, uh, p potential for patients, I think there's still a lot of work we can be doing, but it is definitely uh, something uh, of high value going forward as well. So, so yeah, I think a last, a last, maybe a last um, point that I want to make as well is that when introducing technologies in healthcare, I think when coming back to like non-equity and, and bias, etc., I think the focus always needs to be on inclusive design of healthcare and technology services within healthcare to make sure that if it works for people with disabilities, if it works with people for, with, who have certain conditions, it will work for, for most other people as well um, that need access to it, for example. So, so being able to design an inclusive way that is accessible for everyone, uh, whether it's clinicians, doctors, uh, patients, I think it's a really important uh, thing to keep in mind always, no matter what you design, so that it is, a, it is accessible really for everyone, um, and it will benefit then everyone as well to um, improve their care. So. Fantastic, thank you so much, Isabel. And there's been already lots of questions around the patient perspective and engagement and involvement to take them along with us, so we'll come back to that in a second. Great, thank you. Rishi, over to you for the question of how does some of what you heard from Bob translate to the NHS and your experience? So that's an easy, short question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll share my perspective, but I'd probably preface it by saying that that comes from having been a doctor, having been a chief operating officer and a CIO in trusts, and um, having founded a, a digital health company, and, um, and now as in my role within the Health Innovation Network and at, in South London, and the Digital Health London uh, Accelerator that we run as well. So I get to see a lot of companies and think about how they're implemented, how, how they're working and implementing things in clinical practice. 
Um, I start by saying I think all the observations you made, Bob, about what's happening are really valid for us here in the NHS, and you as well, Isabel, about the way that that works um, in, in, from a patient perspective and as a founder. Um, one of the really reassuring things about that is we are not alone. The same problems that I hear here in the UK are being faced in the States when I talk to colleagues in Germany or Switzerland, which Health Foundation, I, I do quite often through the Health Foundation, um, they face similar problems. And that gives us a real opportunity, I think, to learn from other countries, but also, given the advantages that uh, we have as a, uh, as a fairly unified health system, to do things across the country, to actually help lead on this sort of a, on a global scale. And I would be really excited if that's where we end up. So I think I was gonna briefly mention three things from your talk, Bob. Uh, the first one is why now? Uh, the second is around sort of what parts of your vision resonate for me uh, particularly. And then the third are what are the near-term opportunities and barriers to making that happen in, in practice? All three are quite long things, and I'm very happy to keep talking about them over, over lunch afterwards. But um, I think the why now is a really interesting one. Together with 50% of you, roughly, I think the next five to 10 years is the time that change is gonna happen on this. And I think there are a couple of reasons to really believe that that is going to be the case. So the first is um, the tech is better, and you, you've really articulately said why that's the case. I think you might be being um, the second bit I'd bring to it is sort of the people who are involved in change. And part of that is due to your um, input in your report a while ago and the, um, the impact that's had on the NHS. But as I go around now, there's a lot of people who are really engaging in conversations about digital, how to use tech. They're not all young, but many are sort of digital natives who've grown up with technology, who use it in other parts of their lives. And it means that there are often a lot of people in any given organization who are more up to speed on this than, than sort of the general population are. And I think having just been through the pandemic and had to make a lot of changes rapidly on the ground, use technology and deploy it much more quickly than we have, we changed the way that we, that kind of their power in any organization has changed. Whereas before, they might be the young clinician in a particular specialty who no one would pay much attention to. Now, actually, we've seen you can put something into practice that isn't yet perfect. And as long as everybody behaves in a sensible way and looks out for you know, where it's going wrong and where it's not working well, you can kind of put things into practice earlier than you otherwise would do. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do rigorous testing. We absolutely should. We should design things for everybody. But our threshold for managing risk in that space, I think, is different. And that means that we can move faster than we ever have done before. So that's why I think now is a really good time to be pushing this agenda forwards. I think the vision is really compelling. Um, you highlighted a few of the, the things from AI that come out at the moment. We, we talk about the LLMs, we talk chat, chat GPT, Google Bard. As a result, all my friends who were experts on Brexit five years ago and on pandemic two years ago, and now all experts in AI, aren't they? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I put my hand up when we were talking about the maths models, but I, um, I do actually think that we shouldn't be thinking in terms of the maths model. We should be thinking much more about the way you were doing around what are the applications that we've got for these technologies. Um, and so with that in mind, I think the three big opportunities that um, you laid out, kind of where can you deploy AI and where have we deployed AI? So Gary Ford, who's somewhere in the audience, was reminding me earlier that the kind of the, the biggest large-scale implementation has been in, in, in brainomics, sort of rolling that out. But I would be, I would say the first application is in pattern recognition uh, use cases, where there's loads of data and trying to make sense of it is difficult. And that's where that sort of brainomics thing comes in. But actually, are we deploying AI there? Because it's AI to develop a static algorithm, which is then rolled out. And that's a little different to what we might have in the future of a constantly learning, improving system um, elsewhere. The second is, I think, on re performing repetitive labor saving tasks in, in current workflows, um, either in a supervised way or an unsupervised way. I think the supervised use cases where somebody checks what the output is and applies a human brain to it to make sure that that makes sense are where we'll go first. And I, like you, I'm really excited about the ambient voice technologies, how they might be used now. Health Foundation and the Health Innovation Network have been working with NHS England to try and change the way that that pilot 
that's piloted, tested, and rolled out across the UK. Um, I think the third bit is in supporting where we have a limited workforce, either to prioritise which patients to see, and we're seeing that with ophthalmology in, in, in the way that OCT is interpreted at, at Moorfields, or, um, or, or in actually helping people manage their own conditions. And you were describing that, and I think the, um, um, to manage their own conditions or to find information about what's required. And I, I did see a really, you know, ChatGPT and the way that it's been applied here is, um, is actually just really is a really clever search facility. Mm -hmm. And it looks at, it's trained on information that's out there. And I did see one company that was trying to do that with all our intranets in the NHS so that we could actually find, you know, useful guidelines on things from a trust somewhere in the UK and work out how, what would be best practice to use. You know, really interesting applications for technology that is being developed outside healthcare to apply in healthcare. I did say some limitations. So I'm a tech enthusiast, but I come with 15 years of trying to do this in the NHS. <laughs> a couple of like scars to show for it. So I think that there, we as leaders around healthcare, and, and I look around the room thinking that many people in here have quite a lot of influence about this. We really need to make a decision on whether we want to take a mixed economy and let the leaders progress and then bring others along, or whether we want to move in lockstep and and move more slowly. I personally would love us to move more quickly because I think that trying to do this at scale requires, um, requires a few sites to move really well and be able to show what benefit has been achieved for us to go and see this in practice. I think the second is um, we need a new approach to procurement because the old approach which said, you know, I need a product which is really proven, has a good track record of safety, has been used everywhere before I start rolling it out, doesn't match what we see in the real world of product goes out there, it's applied, people check on it, it continuously improves and you get cycles of improvement. If we move into a world where we roll something out, it's static for 10 years and then we get the next generation, we've got the wrong end of the stick. And I think that then that the third bit is for that to work, in that environment, we really need all the other influencers to take ownership of the risks that go with this in the way that Bob was describing. So, you know, it isn't just the policymakers, it isn't just the people doing implementation. We need the Royal Colleges to take a view on it about what practice looks like in the future and how this might be different and how different people might be practicing in different ways. Skin analytics and the way that they do things in, in looking at dermatological lesions requires a massive change in practice by dermatologists. It's interesting to see how the professional bodies react to that, and, and a single unified response may not be the only way to go on that. Um, and I think then the last bit, I always come back to this, is how we measure what's working and what's changing. And, you know, I think most of the technologies that we're going to look to roll out in the next year or two will have quite, many of them will have quite short-term benefits. We'll look to get the benefits in the short term. You know, I keep being asked, but well, what saving will this make in the current financial year or next financial year? And a lot of the productivity tools that are out there might do that, and, and, and ambient voice technology, I think, is one of the things that's in that category. But actually, has it made the patient's life better? Has it made the clinician's life better? How do we measure that? And how do we measure the broader economic impact of this? Because one of the things I know that um, policymakers are quite concerned about at the moment is the number of people who are on waiting lists who are not economically productive as a result of that. And, and how do we measure all of that benefit as we go through? And, and certainly across the health innovation networks in, in the UK, we're certainly doing quite a lot of work to try and measure that. Uh, at the Hinn in South London, we've just hired our, our health economist into our, our evaluation unit to do that and some of the other hymns are doing the same. So I think that they're the key bits that I think are really important. Um, to take that and scale that up, I think we need to be thinking about, well, what's the plan at the ICB level and the region level? What should be done once across a whole region and, and how do we do that? And, and what networks of people need to be involved in making that decision, including patients within that? So I think that's probably the way that I would go, but I, I'm really excited about this because I think if in, if in two years we had 10 to 15 really great exemplars of how this works in practice, that would be a great result. And if in a year or two after that we had 30 to 50 really great sites across the UK in terms of um, regions that are doing this, that would be really good. Um, 
And I think that's how we'll get to somewhere in five to ten years where this has completely changed practice everywhere. Thank you. Rishi, thank you so much. An applause for both Isabel and Rishi. Thank you. Okay, loads of questions. So one quick round of questions from the floor. Please, if you ask your question on Slido, don't put your hand up and ask it again. It's generally for someone who can't get to Slido on their mobile phone or for, for other reasons. Anyone from the floor? Otherwise, I'll start picking from, from Slido. Yes, there's one in the back there. We've got a microphone. Please wait. And if you wouldn't mind saying who you are. Hi, my name is Robin. I work for an organization called iCare Services, and we provide IT systems to social care companies. Uh, mostly residential care homes. I'd be very interested in how the panel think that healthcare systems can learn from what's already happening in social care, where I would say we are considerably ahead in low ground level implementations of systems that are producing real benefits, small but real, and we are struggling to get a voice into this healthcare discussion. Great. Thank you. Bob, can I maybe turn that to you? I know the distinction of social care, healthcare, are a bit different in the U.S., but examples of social yeah, that, care feeding in? Well, that question would never, ever, ever come up in the U.S. Uh, we don't think about, and, and, and I spent enough time here to know it's, it, it's an almost obvious question here, the integration of social care and the healthcare system is a much more natural act here than in the U.S., where we think of, we don't have a term that we use to, uh, about social care. It's sort of off somewhere else. It's not covered by our, ins our insurance system, we have a much uh, brighter line between, and I say all of this is very bad. I mean, I think that the integration of social care instinctively into an important part of the healthcare system is really uh, a major advantage of the, of the UK. I guess my reaction to that is a little bit of shock because I, I'm always told that even though the healthcare system is a little bit of a laggard in digital transformation, social care is even harder. And, 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 and one of the real challenges if we implement all these fancy systems in the big trust, is that going to create an integrated system across the entire continuum of care? So I have no reaction other than being sort of pleasantly surprised to hear that social care is advanced compared to the healthcare system in certain ways. And I think Rishi's point is really very right. The, the point of view that my group took when we produced our report in 2016 was that trying to be egalitarian across the entire system was a mistake. That, that, that in part you needed to say there are certain exemplars that are going to be ahead of the curve. We need to focus on them, learn from them, and scale that across the system. Otherwise the whole thing will go too slowly. And to the extent that social care has figured out parts of this, the question is how can that be understood, learned from, and then integrated into the rest of the system. Richie, do you want to? Do you want to add to that, Rishi, from my perspective? I'm happy to add a little. Um, my perspective is slightly London biased because looking at this through COVID, um, I've, I've been looking at it in London. I think one of the challenges to learn from how social care has adapted to this over COVID times has been it's a relatively fragmented system where people aren't paid a lot of money and the level of digital maturity is very different. And the fact that it has been possible to make progress in social care in that environment over the last few years is a real... Uh, I think shining light for how we might do it in healthcare uh, uh, further on. Um, I think that one of the things I've noticed about social care, we run a program called um, Digital Pioneers, for, uh, and we have quite a lot of care home um, pioneers as part of that, and trying to bring people up the skills in how to implement their digital solutions locally. It, it's been really instructive for me to see how how enthusiastic people are locally and how they will influence their peers. And I would like us to take that into, into the way that we implement things in healthcare um, and rely on the fact that it won't all move at the same speed because that, that's what we've seen in social care. You know, some places have gone faster. But the moment that you see someone down the road is doing it, you know that it's possible and you're much more likely to get there yourself. Great, thank you. Okay, let me try and bring in some questions from Slido. I'm going to combine a few questions so we get in as much as we can. I'm going to start with a question around patient engagement, patient involvement, because that came up quite a lot, both from Isabel here, but also various questions, including from Daniel Kasson, from Dimitri Vasamis, and a number of anonymous questions. Uh, let me sort of ask the question to you, Bob, first of all. You, know, you mentioned how, for clinicians, making their lives easier 
it's going to be the starting point, probably not diagnosis or difficult clinical decisions. Is there an equivalent from the patient perspective to get their buy-in, particularly if over time we want to get to a point where they actually trust AI, for example, as a decision support, becoming a third player interlocutor in the room with a, with a sort of doctor? How do we get onto that journey? What's the starting point? Well, I think the starting point is the patient portal. And, 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 and maybe that's too institutional focused because the patient portal obviously is an outgrowth of a health system that's made a big investment in Epic or Cerner or some other company's electronic health record. I'm guessing there will be two starting points. One is that, and I see the EHR, the electronic health record inbox, as a transitional phase, a problem created by technology that will largely be solved by technology analogous to ambient voice technology. The problem of, of a provider, and this is not just doctors, nurses too, who are spending all their time documenting, is a problem partly created by technology and now I think going to be solved by technology in the next couple of years. So the EHR inbox is saying that the patients now have access to a huge amount of information that's got to be a great thing, that's the democratization of care, but have not been given any tools to help them navigate their health care. And in some ways, to Isabel's point, that in a this a world that I think is not out of reach is the patient has all of this information in healthcare and asks the question of some GPT-like thing, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? Uh, is there a patient community that I could connect with that would help me understand this better? I mean, there are just a thousand things. Um, you know, I'm having trouble with this medicine. Talk to me about the side effects. Are there alternatives? You know, patients now, when they come to see a doctor, almost inevitably have done a Google search. But I think in the future, they'll have done GPT-like searches, and it's more likely than from a Google search, they will actually get an answer that's usable and may obviate the need for them to connect with the healthcare system. Now, the reason I say that that's part of the portal is from the institution standpoint, from a big trust like mine, we have made that portal available to them and it connects them to our system. I think there's also going to be a level of disruption in the system where companies that have nothing to do with us see an opportunity to deliver a set of services to patients that we're frankly not going to be very good at as a legacy system. And we'll say, and in some ways analogous to, to, to Isabel's company, that say, here's a need that patients have. It's not being addressed effectively by the existing healthcare system because it takes too long to get in or we're too cumbersome or we're stuck in our old ways. We're going to create a tool that directly communicates with patients. They're going to go onto our portal, not Epic through UCSF, but our portal and help manage their multiple sclerosis or help manage their whatever their problem is. And I think there'll be a healthy competition for a, those companies are probably going to be more nimble. They're probably, they're more likely to solve an individual problem. They're more likely to create a tool that helps a person with diabetes manage their diabetes effectively because they're, it may be that their only focus is helping people with diabetes than a, a system like mine that's trying to do everything for everybody. So I think there's, it might be a little confusing for patients. You know, there's the risk of that. I think in a perfect world, the tool that they would get from their patient portal would be the best of everything. It's your connection to the big system, but it's also nimble enough to deal with a lot of problems so you don't have to connect with the big system. But I think for the time being, for the next several years, you're going to see sort of a competition between systems built by legacy healthcare providers, or at least brought in by and bought by those providers, and then a whole ecosystem of new tools built by third-party vendors or built by Amazon or built by Google or who, who knows, uh, that in some ways create two different ways to get care. And I think that'll be exciting to try to figure out which one wins. Now, I could easily see, you know, a lot of urgent care and patient problems being answered through those new tools. What I can't see is those tools doing your surgery or delivering your baby. So there will always be a need for kind of legacy system when, the bricks, when bricks and mortar is required. Great. Isabel, do you want to add to that, particularly the question of building trust with patients? I mean, for example, you've mm. done it through VR and, and, and rehab. How, how did you build that initial trust and overcome that skepticism? I think a lot of... Um, trust issues that might exist today and that have existed, I think, were about not understanding what it can do. And I think education and explaining um, patients and being transparent about what the goal is and what you're aiming to do and how you can help, I think, is something that is on all levels really important. Uh, because I think in the past, often um, patients were put in a box, in a sense, or they were given a box where they didn't understand what was going on inside. They were just given like, you have this and that's it. 
and then you're like stuck with a lot of questions and then obviously now patients go on to Google, they try to understand, they even go into medical journals often, sometimes that they can access it. But I think that's really what is creating trust. Like with AI, it's the same thing. I mean, there's no system today out there that is independently making decisions for patients. There's no AI system that does that on its own today. But it also about that is about educating people about being transparent about what is happening, um, what is happening also with data collection, for example, being able to show, well, this is what we're, what we're doing with your data, do you agree or not, giving people a consent, I think, and that's kind of the way you build trust, making sure that they feel included and they, they feel part of, and they understand what is going on as well. I think that's really important to keep people engaged in everything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so another question. Um, Anne Kinderlehrer asked it initially an hour ago, actually, but it's got a lot of votes for it, which is we know that digital systems can make healthcare safer. Why is it so hard to continue to prioritize actually building them? And then there's associated questions around how do we make the business case for making this happen? It's about implementation and transformation rather than the, rather than the innovation. But Bob, coming to you again, so first, you know, if we know it can be better, why is it still so hard to make it a priority? Well, there's probably various in, the, in our two systems, but in the U.S., the incentives on safety are pretty wimpy. I mean, they're, I'm not sure wimpy is a word here, but that's, that's uh, uh, the, to sell into a healthcare system or to an insurance company, unfortunately, you have to address their business case. And the business case is largely, if I invest this much money, will I see this much more money that I get on the back end? And, you know, more perfect world, the incentives would be more on quality and safety than they are. They've certainly gotten better in the U.S. over the last 10 or 15 years where there's some incentive on quality and safety. But for now, I think a lot of companies are struggling if all you can demonstrate is an improvement in safety, but the CEO of a health system is trying to decide, do I want to make a million dollar investment in the system? And they're not going to see some return on economic investment. The economic return on safety is still pretty muted, at least in the U.S. Maybe, maybe it's better here. Um, I'm not arguing that's an ethical state of affairs, but that's, I think, the practical state of affairs that gets in the way of, um, of the diffusion of some of these tools. Um, I think, you know, the premise as well, I don't know yet that the new AI will improve patient safety. I like to believe it will. I can easily spool out a number of use cases where it should improve patient safety. I think it's been one of the successes of the electronic health record. I think it has improved patient safety in part because there's some low-hanging fruit there. I mean, the, the idea that in the old days I could prescribe a medicine that the patient was allergic to and there was nothing in the system that would alert me that I'm about to do something that could kill a person was crazy. And now the system does have built-in mechanisms that will allow uh, the system to block you from doing something that's, that's, that's potentially dangerous. So I'm enthusiastic about the safety benefits, but I do think as we think about the business case, they've sort of spooled up into that is what are the incentives in the system to promote safety. And I think at least in the U.S., they're not very powerful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do one more consolidated question from the Slido and one more from the floor, and then we'll close probably a few minutes later for, for, the, for the lunch. Um, another uh, group of questions in this slide who came up around how are we going to reimagine the role of the doctor through technology uh, and AI in particular? One question I wanted to pick up from Jack here, who is saying, as a 25 year old NHS clinician, AI will make healthcare unrecognizable by the time I retire. How do I invest or how do we invest in training and development to actually be, be ready for that? So, what's your sense again? I'll start with you, Bob, and I'll come to you, Rishi. How should we start reimagining and what does that mean for training and development? Yeah, I'm in a good position to answer this because, uh, you know, first of all, I'm on the, uh, the senior part of my, uh, of my curve in terms of my practice, but I have a daughter and son-in-law who are uh, just finished medical school a year or two ago, so are residents actually in my program. So I get to see what it looks like from the viewpoint of a trainee. I, for most trainees, the uh, sort of existential threat that you will not have a job because you're replaced by a bot is, is so far out on the horizon and, and so clearly dominated by the reverse of that, 
which is I spend so much of my time doing stupid stuff that adds no value to patients, that feels like it's just paperwork, uh, that gets in the way of my ability to look a patient in the eye and talk to them and be empathic and interpret. Uh, those are the things they want to be doing. That's the thing. That those are the things they've trained for. And so in the sort of near to midterm horizon, they are thinking about how these tools can make their lives better and easier. And for them, and even of people of my generation, none of this is theoretical. They have seen what Amazon has done to shopping. They have seen what Netflix has done to entertainment. They have seen um, what Uber has done to hailing a cab. Uh, they, you know, this is a very familiar story, and they're shocked that they get into healthcare, and it feels like they've gone back in a time machine to 1980. So I think they're mostly excited about it. In terms of what it does for training, I think there's one part of training which, which I think Rishi is, is emblematic of, and it was a key part of our report. There will be people who come into medicine and say, I'm really excited about the potential of this technology. Train me in this so I can be a leader in that field. I think that's a very exciting development, and we really need those people. In terms of what uh, what other what what the physician of the future needs to know, I think it's a pretty pretty tricky question because it's clear that he or she needs to learn less stuff that they memorize than they used to. I'm a little skeptical, and maybe this is because I'm old, that they don't need to know anything, which sometimes people say because everything will be done by GPT, and so you don't need to learn anything anymore. I think that's wrong. I think there is still some foundational knowledge that's going to be important to both allow you to be the overseer of the computer, to be sure that you know that its result is kind of, that makes no sense, um, uh, as well as to ask the right questions of, 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 of the AI. So I think some knowledge is important, but the amount of rote memorization is less important. What clearly is true is they don't need to learn how to code. And, and, and if I was going to emphasize skills for the physician of the future in a more and more digital world, it would be communication skills, it would be interpretation skills, it would be leadership skills, and change management skills, because it's, it's not so much that they're gonna have to learn the technology, in some ways, because the technology is getting so good that they don't have to learn how to code anymore. You can put in prompts into GPT and it will turn it into code for you. But they need to learn how I use this technology to make my system work better and how to be part of a team uh, and build, help build systems that connect different members of the team. So I think there are new curricula, and I think the time for that will be freed up by some, to some extent by learning less, uh, memorizing fewer facts. But um, I, you know, as I look at young physicians now, they're very enthusiastic about that. They are not worried about losing their job anytime. And I'll make one more point. The field where you probably could be worried about losing your job would be radiology or pathology, the fields that are about visual pattern recognition. And uh, about seven years ago, Jeff Hinton, who's seen as the father of AI, he's at the University of Toronto, said we should stop training radiologists now because there are enough of them already that they'll have had their careers play out. And by the time the new ones come out, they will have been replaced by AI. The number of applications to radiology residencies in the US plummeted for a couple of years. And then people woke up and looked at the job advertisements and there were tons of ads for radiologists. And it turns out that you still need radiologists to oversee the AI. First of all, the AI is not perfect yet. Second of all, you need them to oversee it. And third of all, the technology for imaging has gotten so much better that the number of x-rays that we do has gone up faster than the efficiency gains of the technology, at least for the foreseeable future. Maybe, you know, there will be jobs that, that switch, that change in, in their nature, but there, I don't see a lot of unemployed physicians in the, in the future world. And I think the young people are pretty enthusiastic about this. So, Jack, I hope, I hope you feel all right for, the, for, for your future <laughs> and, and that you may be not a radiologist, but you're also doing okay for, for seven years. Richie, any experience from the innovation you've engaged with in the network on the sort of clinician perspective and role change? Um, I, I think Bob summed it up really well, actually. I think the, um, what I would add to it is I don't think this is a new problem. I think it's a flavor on an old problem. If you'd qualified in medicine in the 70s, I, I qualified about 25 years ago. Practice today is different. The way... The, the ability to continue to learn on the job, to develop new skills is still there. And, and you know, if you work in general practice, general practice has changed drastically over this period. What we treat in the community has changed over this period. And I think we're looking at a continuation of that evolution rather than a drastic change here with digital skills added in. 
Great. Okay, now I noticed that there were two hands from the floor. Because we said there'd be lunch and I'm already making you a bit hungry, I'm going to take one more from the floor and then promise the other gentleman that you'll have a chance to ask the question to, to, to the panel, panel afterwards. So last one from the floor here at the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brennan. I just volunteer in the local community and lead one or two national uh, pieces of work about how we better engage with our people and communities, really. Before I, I came here today, I spoke to my friends from the Gypsy Roma Traveller community and I talked about the event when I knew about it today. And what they said to me was, actually, Brent, you know, in terms of our life, we don't see change. What we see is pretty much what we've had, what we've had, and what we've had, really. So my point is around our inequalities, really. So I see this as a great opportunity to reach out to groups and people that were not serving very well with great opportunities to do that. But what I would say is whilst we're doing that, let's take the opportunity for those people to themselves set the measures what measures would they like to see what is their impact etc really um, and what would you like me to take back to joe and delphine from the community today in terms of ai and the lives it will change for them bob what, what can we take back to the community what are the opportunities do some already exist well, I, I, I guess I'm trying to think of what else I can add. I, I think the, the opportunities today are if I had a symptom of a medical illness, I would go on to GPT and put it in to try to see what it means, and I would be pretty trusting of its answer. Now, if I had immediate, if I could snap my fingers and see my GP and get an answer, that's fine too, but my sense is that's hard to do here. And so I think the ability of these new tools to give you answers that are in some ways better and more personalized than what you might have gotten in the past from Google or from trying to look things up, I think it's, it's already better and I think it's going to get better even faster. I mean, the future of this is that unlike what you could possibly get from Google, I can imagine a future state where the answer it gives you on what is this new symptom, I've got a new cough or I'm short of breath, or, is not only based on a review of all of the literature in the internet, but it's also based in part on knowing your own history in a way that a Google search could not possibly do. So is that available today? Not really, but I think that's a relatively achievable future vision. I think what's harder for patients to perceive, but I think may ultimately be just as important, is when you try to see your GP or when you're on a waiting list for a, a given procedure, what that really is a manifestation of is a massively stressed healthcare system where the people, there just are not enough people and resources to deliver the care that you need, and therefore the system is basically uh, stalls out. And so it feels like an abstraction, but at the end of the day, if we can put in place technologies that allow physicians and nurses and others in the system to work 20% more efficiently, because they're just not wasting their time doing stuff that they have to do today, that will play out in a way, you may not know that's what's happening, but you will see the waiting list go down. You will see it easier to find your GP. You will see a world in which maybe you don't have to interact with your GP because you're getting answers and the prescriptions you need independent of your GP. I think that will be the most tangible manifestation for patients, but I, it will be a little, trans, it'll be a little difficult for a patient to perceive that that's what's going on. But inside the sausage factory, that is what has to happen. You know, I don't know that we have enough people, but we've got a lot of people who are highly trained, highly committed, and feel like they're taking 20 or 30 percent of their time and doing them on non-value added activities for patients. And I think at least half of that can be solved if we can implement this technology effectively. Thank you very much, Bob. So small steps, Brent, to, to take back for, for that. Rishi, do you want to? I, I just wanted to add one thing to that, if I may. Um, one of the reasons I got into healthcare. Um, improvement was because of a very poor outcome I saw for someone who's from a traveler community who unfortunately had been lost to follow up because what we did was sent letters to people's houses and that didn't work for them and I think that all the technology that we've got AI being one of them is really important you know the advent of being able to communicate more via mobile via email which we still don't do enough of in the NHS um, is an improvement. The opportunity that we see here is to personalize care, and that we're already seeing 
different training programs and different edu patient educations and support for people from minority communities than uh, to, to help people from minority communities than, it, than the general programs that are out there. A good example being sort of the, the Heal D program for um, diabetes education for people from black and, minor, black and minority ethnic communities. Um, the, you asked the question, what message should you take back? Yeah. So I think for AI to work and to serve people really well, a point Bob made is that we need to have all, everyone's data going into it. And the second point around trust is a really important one, because on my way here today, coming through Waterloo Station, there were two adverts saying, you know, AI is dangerous, be careful of it. We need to get to a point where we trust AI enough that people, everyone, is willing to put their data in, because otherwise the algorithms that come out of the other end won't serve those minorities who've chosen not to have their data in, or who our current services don't serve well, and therefore we're not capturing the data for. So that would be the message I want to give back. That's a good point. Great. So with that, I made you, uh, made you work hard enough for your, for your lunch. Please, <laughs> please stay around. Lunch is being served outside. Uh, we'll be sending around a survey afterwards. Please fill it in. And most of all, a big thank you again to Isabel Rishi and Professor Bob Wachter. Thank you. Thank you.